Chapter 11, video two. We are gonna continue on with our hypothesis testing for means, but this time we are gonna look at a two sample hypothesis test for a difference in means. Now we are gonna revisit our Target and Walmart plastic bag example that we first explored last chapter. So do plastic bags from Target or plastic bags from Walmart hold more weight? A group of AP stats students decide to investigate by filling a random sample of five bags from each store with common grocery items until the bags ripped. Then they weighed in grams the contents of items in each bag to determine its capacity. Do the data provide convincing evidence that the two stores bags hold different amounts of weight? We're going to use an alpha level of 0.05. Now, one thing to consider here is we don't know which bag is going to hold more weight than the other, so therefore we are going to be doing a two-sided test in this example. We don't know for sure if Walmart's bags are better or if Target's bags are better. We just want to know, is there an ultimate difference? Now, just like we did before with proportions, and what we did like in video one with one sample, we are gonna do our hypotheses, check our conditions, perform our calculations, and ultimately write our conclusion. So hypotheses for a two sample problem. You can write it one of two ways. And this was the same kind of scenario that we talked about with proportions a couple chapters ago. We can either state that our two population, but this time means are equal to each other, or we could write it as the difference of the means would have to equal zero, right? If the two means are the same value, then the same values subtracted from each other should produce a zero difference. Now, for our alternate hypothesis, uh, one of three situations are going to happen. We're either going to go greater than, less than, or not equal to. Or the difference of our means, again, will be greater than, less than, or not equal to. So you can write it as either of these two situations here. Write it either as just directly comparing the two means to each other, or looking at the difference of the means, and do they equal zero, or are they greater than, less than, or not equal to zero specifically. Now, when we do this entire problem, we're ultimately always talking about a difference of means. So to me, it makes more sense to actually have our hypotheses written as a difference of means. Now, in either situation, we do still need to define either the individual means, mu1 and mu2, or if we write it as a difference of means, then ultimately we could write just one uh, definition here to say that mu1 minus mu2 equals the difference of the means of, and then you tell me kind of what the one and the two represent. And then you only have to define one thing instead of two things. But in the end, it's up to you. So for our example, again, we said we were going to do a two-sided test because we didn't know for sure if Walmart bags or Target bags were going to be the superior bag. So we are going to be using the not equal to sign for our alternate hypothesis. And again, we could either write it like this on the left side or we could write it as a difference like we have over here on the right side. But again, it's completely up to you which way you want to go. Now, for our conditions, again, condition number one, the random condition, we have to have two. And this is the thing that a lot of people leave out. They forget the fact that they really need to be stating that this is true for both samples, not just for one sample. You can't just say it says a random sample. You would have to state that both samples are random, or there were random samples, plural, just so I know that you are counting this for both of our samples here. So either two random samples or two SRSs, or there was random assignment of the treatments, plural, that's getting at both of those scenarios. Now, for our Walmart versus Target problem, it did state a random sample of five bags from each store. So even though I only said a random sample of five bags, saying that it's from each store is implying that there's more than one store. Now, for the independent or the 10% condition, we do have to check this twice because we have two separate populations. We have two different samples that represent two different populations. So can we assume that there are at least 50 plastic bags from Target and at least 50 bags 
plastic bags from Walmart. And again, in both of those scenarios, I don't even need to say assume true. This is absolutely going to be true. I mean, they probably go through 50 bags every minute. If we, Even if we were looking at like one or two stores, I would say that's easily true. Now, the normal condition, this is where we had to go through our three different scenarios, and I would go through them in this particular order. If both population distributions are given as normal or approximately normal, then we get to state that the sampling distribution of the differences in the means is approximately normal because both population distributions are normal. Now, the thing is, we do reference two population distributions, but in the end, our sampling distribution is only one distribution, but it represents the differences in the mean. So it is a singular sampling distribution based on multiple population distributions that we are subtracting together. So it's kind of like saying a normal minus a normal is still a normal distribution. Now, for our problem, there was no direct information about whether the population distributions followed a normal distribution or not. So we move on. So option two, can we try to use the central limit theorem? Do we have big enough sample sizes? And we only have five bags from each store. So unfortunately, we cannot use the central limit theorem in this situation. So that led us to option three, that we would need to look at our data preferably as a box plot because it'll automatically show us if there are any outliers present. Uh, and we need to do this really for both of our samples. So in the end, we're going to be looking at two box plots. Now you can either do this as one box plot at a time, or your calculator can graph two box plots at the same time on your screen. You just need to turn on plot one and go turn on plot two and tell them to use the different lists that you would have that data in. Now, to get to those box plots, remember you have to go to second y equals to get to stat plot. Um, and then of course you have to have your data already in your calculator, preferably in list one and list two, but they could be in other lists. Once we see those box plots, we are on the lookout for strong skewness and or outliers. And if neither one of those things are found, then we get to state that the sampling distribution is approximately normal because the data sets, plural, or the box plots, plural, show no strong skewness or outliers, and you have to draw sketches of what those box plots looked like on your calculator. Now, my recommendation before you draw them out is to hit zoom nine on your calculator so that it maximizes the box plot on your calculator screen as much as possible. So what does it look like for our bag example? Well, I took a look at the box plots of our two data sets here. And number one, there were definitely no outliers present. And I wouldn't really say there's strong skewness. There definitely is some skewness here. Uh, the target data looked to be skewed leftish, and the uh, Walmart data looked to be more maybe skewed right-ish. Uh, and again, here's the the minimum, the median, and the maximum. And you can tell there there is some difference there, but nothing that I would think would be too strongly skewed. Now, for the calculations, if we want to use that wonderful looking formula. You are going to have to memorize this wonderful formula because it is not given to you on the AP Stats formula sheet. What is going to be given to you is the standard error, the denominator part. You would have to remember that the numerator, the statistic, is the difference of your sample means minus the parameter, which is the difference of your population means. And this is also the null hypothesis value, which just happens to equal zero in most, if not all cases. But before we go and plug and chug, there are some values that we do not know the values of. So we need to know what are the sample means and the sample standard deviations. Well, if you already put your data into two lists and you made box plots, well, we can go ahead and do one variable stats twice, once for the target data and once for the Walmart data. Um, or you could technically in this situation use two variable stats. Two variable stats though will only work when your sample sizes are exactly the same as each other.
So you could technically use two variable stats because we have equal sample sizes of five each. But I went ahead and just did one variable stats on each of my two lists. And I got my sample mean my, and my sample standard deviation value for the Target and the Walmart data set. So then I could plug those numbers into my formula and I calculated what the test statistic is, which is a vital component as part of your answer. You have to provide me with the test statistic value. So we have 3.326. So since it is a positive value, then I would want to find the probability of other T test statistics that are greater than or equal to this 3.326. And again, if this had been a negative test statistic, then I would have said less than or equal to negative 3.326. Now, in the last video, we didn't use normal CDF, but we did use TCDF. So we are going to still use TCDF instead of old normal CDF. And TCDF is, again, it's in the same area as normal CDF. We just got to go a little bit further down the list here. And when we use TCDF, it's going to ask for three values. We need a lower bound, we need an upper bound, and we need the degrees of freedom. But there's a slight problem with degrees of freedom in a two sample problem. There's technically two acceptable ways to get degrees of freedom. And we've already talked about what those two ways were in the last chapter with confidence intervals. We could either use the crazy Satterwati formula, which we would need to know the sample standard deviations and the sample sizes for our Walmart and our target data set. And we know what those values are. So we could do this crazy, crazy formula. But you know what? That's not recommended. Now, the other way, the conservative approach, was to take the smaller sample size minus one. Now, in this situation, just like we had seen previously in the last chapter, we have equal sample sizes of five and five. So it doesn't matter which sample size we pick. Five minus one versus five minus one, the smaller is still going to be a tie. So we will use four degrees of freedom. Now, keep in mind, you only have to use this four degrees of freedom if you're doing all of these calculations by hand. If we use the calculator command, then it will automatically do the crazy Satterwati formula for us instead. So using four degrees of freedom with our TCDF command, then I get a one-sided p-value of almost one and a half percent. But then I had to remember, you know what? We made this a two-sided problem. Our alternate hypothesis used a not equal to sign. So I technically need to double this one-sided p-value into a two-sided p-value. So our true p-value for this problem is just under 3%, 2.922%. Now, if I wanted to use my calculator command instead, I need to name the procedure properly. I can't use its calculator name, but this would be a two sample t-test for mu1 minus mu2, or if you wanted to use words instead of mu1 minus mu2, you would have to say for the difference in means, plural, means. We have two means here, mu1 and mu2. So it's up to you. You can either say mu1 minus mu2, or you can say the difference in means. So when we press stat and we go down to tests, we want option number four, a two SAMP T test. And again, we are hardly ever going to use that Z test situation. But if they give us the population standard deviation, then we would instead use a two SAMP Z test. Now I've got options. I do have all my data already in my calculator. So I can select data and I could do uh, list one and list two. Frequencies, we're going to leave it one and one. And then I would want to set my alternate hypothesis to be that two-sided test where it's not going to be not equal to mu2. We're going to leave pooled always at no. And then you could go to calculate. Now, you also have the option of entering in the stats because technically we already discovered what those numbers were for our two types of plastic bags. So you could type all of these in, then select the alternate hypothesis, leave pulled at no, and hit calculate. And then 
in the very end. Notice here, we still get the same t test statistic. We get, ooh, that's not the same p value. Why do we get a different p value? It's because our calculator used that crazy Satterwadi formula, which is a more precise degrees of freedom than our smaller sample size minus one. So just keep in mind, you're gonna write down the test statistic, the p-value, and you need to write down the degrees of freedom. Now, obviously, I don't want you to write down this whole crazy decimal, you know, round it to one or two or three decimal places, it's really up to you. But I would do at least one decimal place in this scenario. I will commonly do, I don't know, probably two or three. I usually will do like four sig figs, we'll say. Now, regardless, regardless of whatever method you use for the calculations. If you want to use the formula and do it all by hand, good for you. If you'd rather just use the calculator and do the two SAMP T test, good for you. But in either situation, you have to provide me the test statistic, the P value, and the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are much more important for a two sample problem than it was for a one sample problem because there was only one way to get degrees of freedom in a one sample problem. It was just the sample size minus one. But in a two sample problem, there are two different ways to get degrees of freedom. So you need to specify what those degrees of freedom are. You don't have to show me how you got it, but you do need to write down what the degrees of freedom were for that particular problem. Now, again, let's comment again on the differences of the p-values. When we used uh, the more conservative approach, we got a p-value that was just under 3% versus our calculator using the crazy degrees of freedom formula got us something just over 1%. Now, there's not really a huge difference between these two numbers, right? Like little over one, little under three. There's a little less than a 2% difference between these two things. But a 2% difference might make uh, a big uh, difference between rejecting versus failing to reject the null hypothesis in the end. So the one thing that I noted earlier was that if you use those smaller or the smaller sample size minus one for your degrees of freedom, then with this option, the resulting p-value is as large or larger than the p-value calculated from that crazy value. So if you use that conservative estimate for the degrees of freedom, the p-value that you get is always either going to be as big or bigger than what you would get with your calculator command. Okay, don't let that surprise you. Sometimes people will look at these two p-values and they'll go, oh, well, this is because we doubled the p-value because it was two-sided, and this one, it must have not doubled the p-value. Well, it did double it because we told the calculator it was going to be a two-sided test. So this p-value has already been doubled. It's just because of the differences in those degrees of freedom. So our conclusion our p-value, and it doesn't really matter which one we use, whether we use our formula-based one or our uh, calculator-based one, 0 0.0114, 0 0114, I think it was three, both of these are less than an alpha level of 5%. So in either situation, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. Now, a question that would pop up would be, is there ever a time where one p-value maybe is slightly bigger than 5% and then the calculator p-value with the crazy Satterwati formula gives us a p-value that's maybe under 5% and in one situation we, were, we would reject and then in the other situation we would fail to reject? That is absolutely a possibility. So don't freak out. Just use whatever p-value that you calculated either with the formula, with your calculator, or with the actual calculator command. You just go with that p-value. So in the end, since we are rejecting the null hypothesis, we do have enough evidence at the alpha equals 0.05 level to conclude that the two brands of plastic bags hold different mean weights. So what I want you guys to do is now reflect back on last chapter. If I had given you the 95% confidence interval and it is anywhere between 1,073.2 to 6,110.4 grams. Explain how the result of the significance test. Remember, we said we rejected the null hypothesis. How could we also look at this confidence interval and also say that we would still reject the null hypothesis based on the confidence interval? 
So we will discuss that the next day in class.